Hey for the Wild community, it's Ayana here, and I wanted to share a few updates before we begin our conversation with Fabiana Rodriguez. So I am speaking to you on the eve before I head north, first to our reciprocity retreat in the Gifford Pinchot National Forest in Washington, and then beyond to Alaska. I'll be spending the next six weeks with Madison, working with allies on the ground to support the campaign to end old growth logging in the Tongass National Forest. Stay tuned for updates through our newsletter and social media. If you don't receive our newsletter but you want to, you can sign up through our website at forthewild.world. Also, we are looking for land partners for our One Million Redwoods project, and we're specifically at this time wanting to connect with people who tend land in the Redwoods region. So if you steward land that once had Redwoods, or still does but you see space for more, please reach out to us at engage at forthewild.world. Lastly, but certainly not least, I want to thank our 123 DRIP founding members. We're all so damn grateful for the way our community has shown up to support us at this time. If you weren't able to contribute to the podcast on DRIP yet, not to worry because it's ongoing. You can subscribe at any point and receive bonus material and new ways of engaging with us and the content. So check out our campaign at d.rip slash for dash the dash wild. All right. Now on to the show. I believe that this is white men's kind of last attempt to really have power and it's getting ripped out of their hands. And naturally when that is happening, you will have a backlash. The silence is broken by somebody crying Trying to be heard, never a word Always the attitude, sort out your own Always alone, wishing for something The world is denying Out in the wilderness, somebody's crying Somebody wishing for something to happen Wishing to tell, wishing to help Someone was listening, someone who cared Never despaired Someone to lean on and someone to trust Who needs your assistance and finds your disgust Hello and welcome to For the Wild podcast. I'm Ayana Young. Today we are speaking with Faviana Rodriguez. Well, Faviana, on behalf of the entire team at For the Wild, I really want to thank you for your work in imagining a culture of liberation through art. So thank you so much. It's wonderful to have you on the show today. Thank you. I'm excited. Envisioning a world where militarized political borders no longer separate children from the love of their mothers and the stories of their ancestors is an immense endeavor. I won't attempt to paint a picture of the atrocities families are facing at the imaginary yet severely physical line between the U.S. and Mexico right now, because those are not my stories to tell. So instead, I want to begin this conversation by honoring the spirit of the monarch butterfly, the longest migrating insect in the world. Monarch-like salmon symbolize our multi-species right to migrate for survival, a will to survive that women embody fiercely, 80% of whom will be raped on their northward migratory journey. Much of what I have said has been a reiteration of the messaging from the Migration is Beautiful movement, a movement that your art catalyzed. So would you begin by speaking about the beauty of human migration and how you have witnessed the symbol of the monarch butterfly empower migrant communities? Yes, that's a great question. So when I first became a socially engaged artist, a lot of the work that I was doing was often about what we were against or what we were saying no to. And, you know, I grew up in an immigrant family, and so immigrant issues have always been very important to me because I've understood that this immigration system is severely broken. Um, 
And so when I first began to make art and I wanted to speak out against anti-immigration, a lot of the um, messages that I was focusing on were around ending deportations or legalize us or give us amnesty, um, give our communities amnesty. And then I saw many years ago, somebody used the uh, monarch butterfly to show the beauty of migration because the monarch butterfly, you know, flies from Mexico through the U.S. and Canada. And what it sparked in me was to be able to be taught by nature and to be led by nature and to really uphold nature as like, you know, the ultimate truth. And um, nature teaches us that there are no borders. Everything in nature moves. And I think that often in even in political movements, we don't fully integrate the lessons that nature teaches. So for me, when I really began to understand that I was connected to the symbol and I felt that um, this symbol in a, such a beautiful way changed your heart, it changed your imagination. Because if you think about it, you know, many times when we're talking about Latino people, and we're talking about um, migrants, especially whether they're Mexicans or they're Central Americans. Uh, and even if you think about the language that's been used around um, criminalizing narratives or, or saying negative things about them, the, the, the analogies that are drawn are things like those cockroaches, right? They are invading us, this kind of idea of invasion. But when you think about butterflies in flight and you think about the freedom of butterflies, you just have a totally different kind of reaction. And for me, the power of the butterfly is that it helps people really see that all living things move. Like we've always been moving since the beginning of time. And um, to be able to tap that into people's um, hearts and minds and to help them associate that actually migrants are in line with what human beings have been doing for years. And the fact that we criminalize migration and we punish it is a part of a dominant kind of political system. Uh, and so as I began to be you know, more and more engaged in climate change, because I would say environmentalism is something that I've come to in the last eight years, really kind of come to in a strong way. Um, I really appreciate what many people talk about, the extractive economy, right, which is that the system, you know, the system of patriarchy and domination is extractive. It's about extracting from the earth. It's about extracting from human beings and dominating them. And so when I think about the right to move that immigrants have, and I can connect the dots to as we should connect the dots to all living beings, right? Butterflies, salmon. To me, that's just a powerful way to like open up our minds and it's a powerful way to get free because then we understand that, oh, this is the system we currently live under, which is patriarchal and it's extractive and it dominates. But nature actually has provided another way for us. And how do we kind of tap more into that? As rapid planetary change continues to pressure all types of beings to migrate for survival, mm -hmm. we must not only dismantle the ways that white supremacy and global capitalism are criminalizing migration, but also ensure that people understand how U.S. imperialism is largely responsible for the flow of migrants from Mexico, Central and South America in recent decades. I'm wondering if you could help us understand a bit more thoroughly how NAFTA signed in 1994, displaced and disrupted local economies, pushing people to flee north. Absolutely. Um, you know, I was I was a teenager in 1994 when NAFTA was passed by Clinton. And uh, the, the narrative that he talked about was, oh, here was a world without borders. But interestingly, he actually, uh, they began to build the U.S.-Mexico border that same year in 1994. Um, but what that meant is that, you know, the U.S. could openly just go in and dominate and also bring their GMO corn, which the American GMO corn disrupted the local economies in Mexico. And corn is not just um, a, a, a food in Mexico. Corn is a part of the national identity. You know, there's a saying that 
it says, si maíz, no hay país. Without corn, we have no country. I mean, corn is the basis of the tortilla. So when you disrupt such a critical economy that is central to people's culture and their ancestral traditions, um, and then you also come in with, you know, factory farming, or you come in with, you know, things that begin to disrupt the food chain, uh, you, you, you disrupt entire economies. And I think that, you know, U.S. imperialism, when we really begin to understand it, not only is it, you know, militarized systems, but it's also the stealing of natural resources. So we have to always remember when we talk about climate change and we really talk about, well, what got us here? What got us here is that we have, we have not used energy and resources in a way that is sustainable and the, there have been um, powers that do that more than others, the United States being one of them. And so we have really created a um, ecological disruption to so many areas in the world. And what happens when you have ecological disruption, what follows, because remember, we're completely reliant on the earth to live. So when you extract natural resources and you steal people's ability or you begin to tax certain part of what they export, and when people can no longer survive on their land, that leads to political instability. Just like droughts led to political instability in Syria, which created the Syrian migration crisis. It's the same thing, that when we don't act, when, when we behave in a way that's greedy and we violate the land and we disrupt the ecology, we also disrupt people. And maybe over 20 years, 30 years, you won't feel it. But after hundreds of years, people are gonna feel that. Just this is what's happening even in migration in Europe. The English colonize so many parts of the world and now migrants are going to those places from which they were colonized because their homelands are so disrupted. And so to me, that really illustrates this like huge intersection that we have with the environment, ecology, however you want to call it, is that the effects of what happens when we go in and not act in a sustainable way with the land, we will disrupt it. We will eventually cause huge problems like mass migrations, like what we're seeing right now, where you have families showing up at the border with their children and you have children traveling on their own, you know, sometimes as young as six, people are putting themselves at that risk because they can no longer tolerate the instability and poverty and the violence, the, the just blatant violence that's happening. And on top of that, then the United States begins to criminalize that. And guess what? Who makes money? The prison industrial complex. Where are they where are they incarcerating these people? They're incarcerating them at the U.S.-Mexico border in the Rio Grande Valley. Hey, guess what kind of water they drink? They drink fracked water. And the kids, as a result, are very sick. So these things are very interconnected. And I think, you know, as an artist, it's very important for me to, to really tell those kinds of stories because it's not about, you know, climate change is an issue here and immigration is an issue there. It's not like that. It, the, these are not, we don't separate our lives by issues. We experience very kinds of intersectional oppressions. And I think that art is a really good way to talk about that because art is about your emotions. Art is about really understanding a story and being moved by it. And I think that for the kinds of connections that we need to draw and really help people understand, art is critical to that. Para ser humana, pero muy mundana, para 
ser diosa, por eso soy odiosa y bastante caprichosa, por eso digo lo que pienso, aunque incomoda. No me pasan en la radio, no les voy a pagar. Si el honor es suyo, no me voy a rebajar. No me invitan a sus fiestas, ni a sus festivales, pero me ponen fuerte en las marchas, en las calles. Sabes, no quiero un carro del año, quiero aprender a manejar mi vida sin hacerme daño y sin hacerte daño. Pues que voy a cantar si tuviera el alma podrida, si no me atreviera a sanar. ¿Qué tal? Me llamo Rebeca, tengo orejera de jade, tengo tatuadas las piernas, los brazos y en los puños los ideales. Soy un volcán, soy una pantera y tengo manada de perras. No le canto a cualquiera, le canto a mis lobas, le canto a guerreras. Soy un volcán, soy una pantera y tengo manada de perras. No le canto a cualquiera, le canto a mis lobas, le canto a guerreras. Por la boca es tu polaba, corazón de obsidiana, alma de anciana, sabia, rabia, música y magia. Por la boca es tu polaba, corazón de obsidiana, alma de anciana, sabia, rabia. I absolutely agree with everything you said from the uh, importance of art and really understanding these intersectional issues and then also explaining how we're in the situation we are at with immigration through U.S. imperialism and just bullying. I mean, it's it's really crazy to zoom out and see what the United States does all over the world. Uh, coming into countries, stealing resources, creating instability, profiting off poverty and suffering. Yeah. It's really disgusting. <sighs> um, you know, you write and speak about how artists who are activists must work in the space of ideas. In your published conversation with Teddy Cruz and Dominique Wilston, the example that was given that it would be ineffective to waltz into Congress proclaiming that borders are irrelevant because culture precedes law. Along that same vein, I heard you speak about how the term illegal was crafted by a white supremacist network, knowing that if they succeed in painting immigrants as the other, then they would win the cultural war. So with those examples in mind, could you share your perspective on art as cultural strategy, and then perhaps elaborate on how art as a force of social change can shift migrant narratives away from criminalization towards celebration, resilience, and strength. Yes, um, I love to talk about art and the power of art. Uh, so, so first is you know understanding culture and um, and how culture works. And so, in order to have social change, lasting social change, three things have to be into alignment: politics culture and economics. And those three sectors need to, or those three kind of worlds need to be aligned. Um, and so, for example, when we talk about the gun debate, uh, there have been parents who have been fighting for gun control since after Sandy Hook, and yet we have not had political change. The political world has been frozen or has simply not moved. And meanwhile, we've had the economic space. You know, there could have been companies who um, many years ago began to take some economic measures uh, to limit the sales of guns or to do something to address the issues. But that world was not, uh, did not feel compelled to do that. Um, fast forward many years later and you have the kids in Parkland, Florida, who um, begin to once again share their stories and really you know, share their human stories. And they begin to get some um, momentum in the press. What did they end up doing? They ended up pressuring the economic sector as we saw Walmart and Dick's Sporting Goods change their policies. And I believe it happened within a week or two. Um, and now that's creating pressure on the political sector to move. So if we understand that those three things have to be working in unison, we can also uh, identify that culture 
is the um, the component that moves them both. Because when you have cultural pressure, the economic sector will yield and eventually the political sector will yield. But the political sector is the one that moves the slowest. And that's because, frankly, you know, you have these white men in power who, um, you know, we have a very broken system and those who represent us don't actually even reflect the country or the world we live in. So um, if, if the space of culture is very powerful, it's where we create the narratives of how we identify, it's how we perceive other people, um, it's everything. It's how we dress, how we talk, how we express ourselves, where we spend our time, how we spend our dollars. All of that is shaped by culture. And culture is made up by music, film, television, art, games, food. There is so many different components that make up culture. And so I believe that if culture moves the fastest, then we need to be having the stories and the songs and the films that really reflect the world we want to see. And this is actually why I've been involved now also with the Time's Up movement, which is the movement uh, led by women in Hollywood, led by survivors, to really talk about representation. Now, art is about what you see and feel. And so if you're consistently looking at a screen and you have white men acting out all these different roles, or you have just straight up heteronormative people, just like, or, or you have these dominant cultures on TV, you will begin to normalize those cultures. And then when you see, you know, black people only being presented a certain way, you're going to start normalizing that in your brain. You know, we are we are still creatures that are moved by our hearts and our imaginations. And these messages work in our subconscious. And so if we're watching TV and we keep seeing people driving cars, you know, and they're burning fossil fuels, do you think that we're going to think about renewable energy? We're, we don't even see solar panels on in film and television. So if for me, culture is a space where we absolutely need to, one, take back the tools of culture making and we have to make it an equitable space. But we also have to think about what stories are we really telling? Like, well, how do we, you know, tell stories that are about inclusion, about togetherness, about sustainability? If we begin to normalize these through music, film, television, art, then we have the possibility of actually going there because every single major social movement was always led by culture. Right. The, the AIDS fight during the Reagan era that was led by ACT UP. That was posters. That was advertisements. That was Keith Haring, you know, and then you had more and more queer people on TV. You had the AIDS quilt. Uh, it's the same thing when we had in the civil rights movement, you had music, you had literature. So culture is indispensable and it's hugely important. And so as a as a person who works in culture, not only am I an artist and I you know, do my work as an artist and, and create these art experiences. But I also work with many other artists because I believe that artists actually are very crucial to social change. And I think that when we include artists and when we really can tap into the power of what artists can do, we are more likely to win. And what I mean by win is we are more likely to achieve equity, justice, and equality. So moving on to your, your second part of your question, which is about um, the butterfly and how it can change attitudes towards migrants, is because all of the attitudes that we currently have towards migrants were created and designed. They were created and designed by white supremacists, by white nativists, who knew that if they use language like illegal, if they show pictures of people running across the border, and if they framed things in a certain way, again, they're using culture and they're framing these things in a certain ways that are very subliminal, then they would be able to pass harsh policy. It's the same thing, you know, with police brutality. You know, I mean, it's, you would not, we, if, if white people were being killed at the rate that black people are being killed, that would end in a few days because of white outrage. But because we are so used to seeing dehumanizing depictions of black people on the screen, or we just don't, there's a lot of people who don't even interact with black people. And so much of what we see is, we see is racist that actually changes people's attitudes. And we can live in a country where black people are constantly being by killed by the police and nothing gets done. It's the same thing with immigrants. We have been taught that immigrants are less than, they're less deserving. And imagine if we lived in a society where we valued people who moved because it was a part of nature to move. And if we said, wow, you know, you've traveled all this way 
It's clear that you need a safe place. Let us welcome you. You know, have a seat, drink some water. You're safe now. We're going to welcome you. Imagine if we had that kind of society and imagine if we built monuments to migrants. I mean, migrants are the ultimate, they, they, they are really doing something that is the ultimate human story, which is that you leave your home to, to go into a distant place that you have no idea what it's like, but you go because you want to survive or because you want to be with your loved one. But that's a beautiful story. And I think that for, for me with art and with the butterfly, it's really about how do we show the beauty and the resilience and also just the humanity of migrants in a way that will make us remember that we're human and that migrants are human too. And that as human beings, we don't want to cause this level of pain to another community. And so with my art, I'm really trying to attempt to do that through different symbolism, storytelling, and um, supporting other artists who also want to do that. And I'm wondering, how has your work in terms of cultural strategy gained or changed meaning under this political administration? Not to say mm -hmm. that other administrations in the past haven't right. been terrible in their own ways, but, you know, what's happening now under Trump for you? Well, what's happening now is that I am extremely tired. I'm very tired and I'm working double time. I never would have imagined. I just would have never imagined that we would have gone so backwards and that um, the sheer level of hate and... Um, and just, you know, domination and, and, and overwhelmingness of everything because we're barely recovering from the Muslim ban. And then we then are understanding that families and kids are being separated at the border. And then we can barely recover from that. And we see another shooting and then we can't recover from that. And we're seeing, you know, the extraction in the oil pipelines where, you know, indigenous people are trying to fight. And then you see that, you know, Trump is giving away pieces of land that are so important to wildlife and it's completely overwhelming. And you see the people that are hired to run everything from the EPA to Homeland Security and it's completely overwhelming. But I also think that it has required all of us to really bring forth our best game and our best efforts because what we're up against is so significant. And it's also, in a way, it, it is like the end of this kind of ideology. I believe that this is white men's kind of last attempt to really have power and it's getting ripped out of their hands. And naturally when that is happening, you will have a backlash, but it'll be the last backlash. So I, I feel that I'm witnessing a shift in the sense that I'm witnessing new normals that are going to be here to stay. And whether that's, you know, trans people being elected to office or whether it's black women being elected to office or seeing a black renaissance on television, seeing more shows of people of color than we have ever seen. Um, and, and I also see, you know, just what's happening in, in climate conversations. You know, I'm in a lot of I go to a lot of kind of conferences and gatherings where we're talking about. Um, environmental justice and and we're talking about climate change and I see even the um, environmental movement asking itself very critical questions around our future so I think I've never worked this hard in my life and part of me is also like wow this is what life is going to be like for a few years is that we are consistently going to be having to fight for our basic dignity and also knowing that we're we're part of a new story that is being formed and that's very exciting. So while I'm feeling just um, constantly overwhelmed and sad about everything that's happening, I also feel a great sense of clarity of what's needed. And I'm so excited to actually be fighting alongside so many different people now. You know, I, I, I was just at the U.S.-Mexico border and um, I saw a lot of white people come to the immigration protests. And I'm now, um, you know, in places where I interact with a lot of actors and uh, from Hollywood and I see in them this desire to also want to do things, want to really be, um, should I stop? 
I pause for that thing to go by. <laughs> I hate this ice cream truck. Uh, I hate this ice cream truck. Okay. So anyway, so I'll, I'll rewind. I, I, I'm very excited to be part of communities of change where we are just really taking ownership of how we shift things. Yes, I agree that that's part of the beauty of this time is seeing so many people wake up, people from different positionalities and privileges and and communities coming together. I mean, that really is a beautiful part of this movement right now. And I want to go back to migration again. And, you know, to be honest, Mm -hmm. I cannot even begin to grasp the scope of the frightening realities that immigrants are living with. You know, as Trump just charges blatantly ahead in this dehumanizing, supremacist, racist, xenophobic fashion, and prior to Trump, a surging of the undocumented and unafraid movement was praising the stories of undocumented youth. But now, I've been hearing about how fear is being overcome by terror, and how migrant communities are silencing and policing themselves for self-preservation. And rightfully so. I mean, I read an article about a young man named Jorge Herrera who was stopped by police in San Bernardino, California for riding his bicycle without a headlight, then detained and deported. So the stories of immigrant rights activists who were recently targeted and deported in direct retaliation for their political organizing, you know, it comes at no surprise. So I'm wondering, would you be comfortable to share your thoughts on how this unhinged U.S. deportation regime is impacting not only the well-being of migrant communities, but also their ability to make art and organize for social change. Yeah, um, so, you know, I was born in the United States, so I'm myself, I am not an immigrant, I'm I'm a citizen, and this is my home. And yet so many of my family members growing up were undocumented. I mean, my parents were undocumented before I was born. So I've understood um, what it is, just the, the ongoing fear. And I've lived close to people who experience that on an ongoing basis. And most recently, when I um, really began to meet more undocumented young people, and I would say this is a new generation of of, um, migrants that came a few generations after my parents. But when I began to meet these youth and I began to see how they were so courageously coming out with their stories of being undocumented, um, I felt very compelled to connect with them because, you know, when I was a young person, I would always really look for mentors and just try to connect with adults who, you know, could support me as an artist. And so when I became an adult, I realize, or an older person, I realize that it's so important to connect with younger people. And so when I connected with younger undocumented people and really began to understand that 
in them coming out, they are telling a story. They are sharing their humanity and they are using the tools of culture, storytelling, to really offer us a view of what it's like in their shoes. And for many years, you know, many uh, undocumented youth came out in 2010, and that's when I would first see, you know, 2009, 2010, just like the more normalization of what it means to be undocumented, because previous to that, when I was growing up, nobody would talk about being undocumented. It was like a big secret that we all knew but never talked about. Whereas what I was witnessing in 2009, 2010 were young people coming out and it was very powerful. It also really shifted politics. I mean, you know, 2010, you have young people coming out with their status, immigration status. And by 2012, the president is um, signing into law um, relief for these youth through DACA. And so we see that the storytelling strategy was very successful in moving politics. And that for years, you know, through Obama's second term, we also saw immigrant youth tell their own stories from their lived experiences through art and music and film and performance. And so when I witnessed the way in which Trump's selection literally created another level of fear, it's almost like a re-traumatizing. And it's very, very... Um, evil, how some laws disregard humans and their emotions and their trauma. Some undocumented people did go back in the closet, as many people say, but others didn't. And so I think that I don't I don't have a judgment on when people decide to take measures for their own safety. You know, when I came out about my abortion and people were, you know, I had people who would um, pop my tires and I had the worst aggression ever experienced on social media that I've ever had and people threatening to kill me and all these things, I realized, wow, you know, sometimes it's actually not safe to come out with your story. And that's everyone's own call. You know, sometimes you may not be in a safe environment to say you're trans or to say that you're a survivor of sexual abuse, or sometimes you're not safe to say that you're undocumented. And so I think, um, we, that's important to respect and also important to use our privilege to make spaces safer. And that's what I try to do as somebody who has an American passport and I have my citizenship is I really try to use my privilege so that I can help create spaces where undocumented people can express themselves and where I can you know, support them and, and really help amplify their stories. Do you consider the digital sphere, you know, social media as a safe space for undocumented artists to share their stories? Sometimes, because people who troll feminists or people who troll immigrants or people who troll anyone with progressive ideas, those are very highly organized mobs organizing people to all go comment at the same time. So these trolls are organized and sometimes they can be dangerous. I think that digital spaces, there is a perception that they are safe, but I don't believe that because, you know, especially now when we've understood the spying that Facebook has been doing on us and we understand that Cambridge Analytica is selling our data and then you see that we're under a fascist regime, you know, the FBI under President Trump has a new designation for black liberation fighters. They're called black extremists. So there are many situations in digital media where it's important to take precautions and it's actually important to really consider your own safety. Um, at the same time, you know, I, I didn't grow up with the Internet. I didn't have the Internet until I was my first year in college. And for me, the Internet has been so crucial in having a voice and a platform. And so even though I have been trolled, I mean, even Breitbart wrote something about me. I still, I love the tools that technology offers me to have a platform. I, I go back and forth. I don't think these spaces are always safe. I think just like technology, technology is always changing. It's important to just uh, always revisit how you are sharing in social media and also know that it's a space to really get the word out and to have a platform. Mm-hmm. The Trump administration is pushing many of the long-standing insidious ills of American society to a visible extreme. 
And perhaps it takes images of toddlers in cages for Americans to wake up to the violence this government has always reaped. But I wonder how long will it take for these headlines to fade? And I also wonder how Attorney General Jeff Sessions' recent decision to deny immigrants asylum from domestic and gang violence will feed back into the social dynamics that are pushing children and mothers northward. Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. Well, honestly, like, my stomach hurts when I talk about this because it's just, it's such a hard and complicated and violent reality. Um, so first is that, you know, we are in the age of uh, narco violence in places like Mexico and in many places in Central America. And the drug, the demand for drugs that's fueling this kind of violence is because of American demand for drugs. So, and not just that, but we are, we are providing the guns for all the violence to happen. So, for example, in Mexico, over 75% of the guns that are used in violent situations are from the United States in killings and in just atrocities. And then if we think about, for example, in Central America, that the United States under Reagan went in and literally hired military to go in and rape women and brutalize and torture and burn the farmlands of people in the name of ending communism. I mean, it's just, it's very horrific what was done in the 80s in Central America. And as a result, those countries have been very destabilized you know, people had to migrate to the United States, right? A lot of Salvadorians, a lot of Mexicans had to migrate to the United States. But guess what? The United States treats people of color so bad that often kids of color, their only options for employment are selling drugs or getting into gangs or basically getting into illegal activities because, hey, you know what? We live in a racist world and people ain't going to hire you. You're not going to get hired. You're actually more likely to get incarcerated. Then you have gangs, you have more drugs happening in the United States. And then, then when some of those men now who, who came to the U S as refugees, they're now men, and then they get involved in violent things, then they get arrested and then they get deported back to their home countries. But imagine now they've returned and, um, many of them are criminals and they are then bringing, um, they they begin to terrorize in their own home countries. But this all began with American intervention. So when you really understand the years and years of brutality that now exist in these countries, you know, in places like Guatemala and all throughout Central America and even in Mexico and Juarez, femicides, the femicides, the killing of women were at all time highs. Well, you have children being recruited into drug violence. We have just completely destabilized them. So much of this not only is just straight up human rights abuses, but it's about rape and domination and male aggression. That's what we have normalized in, in many of these countries. And that's what these drug, this drug trade does. And when we take away the basic human rights and we no longer look at patriarchal violence, which has plagued these countries because we, we exported that, we set that up, Reagan and, and even people before him, and then we take away one of the small things that women could access. You know, one of the small things that women could say, no, you know, I fear for my life or I was abused or I am I can't go back because I, I might be raped or abused. And, and on top of that, these women, 80 percent of them who are crossing the border have been sexually assaulted. So just consider that for so many women and trans people and, and queer people, they have been experiencing assault for so much of their life and that they can't access legal frameworks to protect themselves is horrific. And it, it makes me sick. I so understand that this is an issue of white supremacy, but it's an issue of patriarchy. When you crush the women, when you crush women, you destroy societies. Uh-huh. Rebecca 
Solo son las erecciones, son las lecciones de un pueblo sin memoria que se toma las calles pero no lee historia. La verdadera guerra no ha terminado. Los que nos masacraron han controlado en el Estado. A quien conviene el orden que se mantiene. Perdonen, pero el optimismo ya no me sostiene. Hago lo que puedo, pero no es suficiente. Aunque intento, no entiendo al resto de la gente. ¿Qué más das? Igual no me entiendo a mí. Vivo en conflicto y no sé a dónde ir. Si no me hace reír. Prefiero no seguir Si no me vibra el corazón Prefiero huir No encuentro la respuesta No recuerdo la pregunta Quiero claridad Pero solo encuentro penumbra Pero el dolor alumbra Y mis cicatrices brillarán Con cada mirada que ambos le apunta Reina y señora del caos que me habita A veces tirana A veces proscrita La mejor batalla es conmigo misma Soy autogobierno Mi bandera es anarquista Reina y señora del caos que me habita a veces tirana, a veces proscrita La mejor batalla es conmigo misma Soy autogobierno, mi bandera es anarquista Y no voy a hacer arte nada más para complacerles No voy a censurarme para no incomodarles Vengo a contar mi historia, no a tener buenos modales No vine a quedarle bien a nadie No vine a hacer las paces, no me pongo disfraces No vine a repetir las frases de organismos internacionales No salgo a protestar para que la gente me vea Y luego subir fotos para que crean en la calle hay pelea Yo no elegí la guerra, pero nací guerrera Y lo seré hasta en el día que me muera Ni perdón ni olvido, aunque la llaga me duela la llama en el alma me consuela Ay, no busco un escenario para amenizar tu fiesta Cada una de mis letras una falla en el sistema Los dinosaurios duermen con el arte sin protesta Que se extingan de una vez en el planeta Que se extingan de una vez tú Reina del caos Reina y señora del caos que me habita a veces tirana, a veces proscrita La mejor batalla es conmigo misma Soy autogobierno, mi bandera es anarquista Reina y señora del caos que me habita A veces tirana, a veces proscrita La mejor batalla es conmigo misma Soy autogobierno, mi bandera es anarquista Well, we are so inspired by your approach to creating politically engaged art and how you encourage art that expresses the complexity and multiplicity of human experience. And then instead of only reacting to injustice, you tend narratives of joy and resilience. And I want to ask, do you think that our dedication to joy pleasure and creativity must only grow fiercer as the militarization of global capitalism seemingly only increases in brutality. Yes, I think, I think, yes, I believe that because the, the truth is that the level of trauma that our communities are going through is, is severe. I mean, we are now living in a moment in, in the moment of me too, thanks to Tarana Burke, we're living in a moment where we're understanding just how normalized sexual violence is in our society. Okay, so we're dealing with years and years of abuse and assault on, on women um, that is now starting to just begin to be uncovered. And we're understanding that so much of the behaviors that we, that we thought were normal, like sexual harassment, you know, and that perhaps in the past we couldn't speak out about, now we're understanding that we can speak out about it. And when you realize that so many people, so many people of color, black people, Latino people are in prison and that prison has people in cages and that prison, prisons are the new form of slavery. When you understand that and you understand that, you know, that we live in a, in a society where a black person who might want to go to the park um, and is driving just has to fear for their life when they get pulled over by an officer of the law. These are very harsh times. These are very sad truths. And 
those can break people because they're just like, you know, when, when the plant gets shut down in your community and you no longer are able to sustain your family, um, or when, you know, you have no other choice but to work in the slaughterhouses where we're torturing animals because that's the only industry available to you, or you have to, you know, work in a coal plant, you know, there, there is capitalism and patriarchy and this extractive economy have really, really damaged people. That's why I think so many people are medicated in this country. I really believe that we are, where people are, are sad. They are isolated. People work too much. They have to work because of our capitalist reality. And all of these things are very significant as well as I know that our bodies are feeling the pain that mother earth feels. I know that, you know, the, the, the rise in, in, in sicknesses and illnesses related to pollution or dirty water, all of that, we're, those are in our bodies and we're connected to Mother Earth. So when, when we understand that that level of suffering is so severe, we have to equally reach towards our joy and our freedom because that is what's going to sustain us. The one thing that they cannot control is our mind and our imagination. And the imagination is a very, very powerful tool. Einstein said that imagination is more important than knowledge. So I think that for us to tap into our joy and our resilience means that we are tapping into our power and that we will be able, you know, despite injustices that have been committed against us, that we will be able to thrive. And so, yes, to me, joy and freedom and a real ability to tell our stories is going to be part of our superpower to live in a more just world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. A few years ago, you released a slut power series with images of women of color and messages such as politicians off my putang, my uterus is mine. And I would just love to hear what slut power and pussy culture mean to you. Yes. Well, what it means to me is that, you know, just like we have these laws that tell you that um, Latinos are invading you and you have to be afraid of them and you have to be afraid of black people. We also have these these narratives that tell us, oh, you know what? It's like, keep your legs closed. Your pussy's dirty. It smells or your pussy should only be used to pleasure um, a cis man. Uh, so I I counter all those messages. To me, reconnecting with my body and loving my body means I am connected to nature because this is what I have. Like when I am really truly embodied, I, I'm human and I get to experience what human beings experience with nature, you know, and I'm not just here to be a productive gear in the machine called capitalism. I'm here to be a human being and to connect with animals and to enjoy plants and to enjoy many other species. And in order to do that, I want to love myself. I was taught to hate myself. I mean, I was taught just like so many girls that you're ugly and that you should hate your body. So for me, pussy power is a way to take that back and to love myself. Mm. I love how you're working with pussy power and uh, migration rights and climate change. And I am just so grateful for the intersectionality that you bring to your work. And, you know, we touched on climate change at the beginning, and it seems that the climate movement is really struggling to move beyond charts and graphs towards actually activating people through art. And I'm wondering how do you think climate change related art could be more captivating and solution inspiring. Climate art and the work that deals with ecology and the environment, I think right now has been mainly done through one kind of perspective. And that perspective is the perspective of white men. So when I grew up and I would, you know, look at nature channels, images of people hiking in the magazines or watch commercials and there was people out in nature, they were always white. And they were always men. So I never really saw myself in nature. And I lived in a city, you know, I live in California. I lived in a city of cement. And uh, my parents just worked too hard. So I couldn't access nature. Um, sometimes I would join camps. My parents would put me in summer camps. And I would love to be in nature. But I didn't have access to it 
in the ways that other people didn't, specifically white people just have more access to nature. White privilege earns you access to nature. For me, it's really important to always see stories of nature that are also where I see people of color in those settings. You know, I see um, black people connecting with animals or I see, um, you know, Latinos out in the forest or hiking or swimming. So the first thing is I think we need to unlearn what we've been taught and that we need to see stories of people of color in nature more. Um, Because that will also show young people of color that nature is for them too. Nature is where they can also connect and enjoy because unfortunately inequality has it so that many poor people of color and poor people live in very highly urban settings where we just don't have access to it. I think that the climate movement needs to also understand that we need to have narratives that include humans precisely because we have to undo the white supremacist environmental images that we've been so used to. We have to unwire our brains. So it's going to take showing humans of color, human beings who are people of color, connecting to nature. And it also means that we need to think beyond, when we talk about global warming, for example, we need to think beyond CO2 because it's not magically being created. CO2 is being created because of white men in power. And um, the decisions that white men are making is having huge, significant impact on the environment. And the people who are suffering the most are communities of color. So we need to tell the stories because it's not just that the earth is getting hotter. It's getting hotter because of human activity. And so we need to be able to show that. And I think so often when we talk about climate change, we're not seeing the full story. You know, we're seeing we might see a polar bear. But you know what? Also, there are the effects of climate change is also that in places like Fresno or in Long Beach or in downtown L.A., the pollution from burning fossil fuels is so, so bad that you have generations of kids with asthma. So those stories need to be told, because unless we tell those stories in a very comprehensive and well-rounded way, we are not going to move people on this issue. We're not going to win their hearts because we're not showing the full truth of what climate change is, who causes it and who suffers the most. So I I believe that we need to be having a different kind of storytelling. We need to be also telling stories that show the impact on many different species, humans definitely, but many different species and how, how our suffering might also be connected to the suffering of a, of, of an animal who was raised in captivity and is, being forcibly impregnated uh, and then separated from their offspring, similar to what is happening at the border. You know, the way that cows are separated from their offspring, they're forcibly, they're raped, you know, and they're, when, when you get forcibly impregnated, that is an assault on your body. And so I think we need to draw those connections more in art. We need to tell stories that show how also, you know, what drilling means and how we're extracting the natural lubrication of the earth and how that is also an act of violence and assault. Um, and so I'm, I'm as an artist, that's what most inspires me is to be able to uh, create cultural work, cultural content that helps draw those connections. Mm. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Fabiana, for all the work that you do. Like you were saying, the tireless work with all of the issues today. So Thank you so much from everyone at For the Wild, and we really appreciate you. Great. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you for listening to For the Wild podcast. I'm Ayana Young. The music you heard today was from Rebecca Lane, hailing from Guatemala. You can find her new album available on Bandcamp. Also, check her out on tour going on now. I'd like to thank our incredible podcast team, our editor and producer, Andrew Stores and March Young. Research director, Madison Magolski. Media director, Molly Lebov. And research assistant, Francesca Glassbell. Questions for this interview were crafted by Madison Magolski, Francesca Glassbell, and myself. Until next time.